Uh, our sermon passage today will be Ezekiel chapter 21 and 22. Our reading now will begin in chapter 22, verse 17. Ezekiel 22, beginning at verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. All of them are bronze and tin and iron and lead in the furnace. They are dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because you have all become dross, therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As one gathers silver and bronze and iron and lead and tin into the furnace, to blow the fire on it in order to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my wrath, and I will put you in and melt you. I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst of it. As fire is melted in a furnace, so you shall be melted in the midst of it. And you shall know that I am the Lord. I have poured out my wrath upon you. And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made wit many widows in their midst. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have disregarded my Sabbath so that I, so that I am profaned among them. Her princes and her midst are like wolves tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have practiced extortion and have committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and have extorted from the sojourner without justice. I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me in the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their head, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer, and nearest kinsman. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. One of the hardest things to experience in the Christian life is the gradual hardening of a fellow Christian. Someone that had once had zeal and passion, faith and obedience, has become hard toward the gospel. They refuse to hear either the warning found in God's judgment, or they refuse to hear the goodness that is found in God's grace. In the book of Ezekiel, what we have seen is, is what this hardening looks like when God's people as a whole reach this point. Throughout this Old Testament scriptures, God's people have been brought out of Egypt, brought into a land, flourished for many years, but for the last 400 years, they have been undergoing a cooling off and a hardening. And as I said in last week, when you're kind of reading through the book of Ezekiel, the pace picks up in chapters 20 and 21 and 22. It is leading up to the beginning of the end in chapter 24. And so these passages function as sort of a montage in a film. It is showing clip after clip. It is giving word of the Lord after word of the Lord, scene after scene, that Jerusalem's inevitable and justified destruction. And so Ezekiel in 21 and 22 gives a, a fast-moving, a comprehensive case for the inevitable and the justified judgment of Jerusalem. And yes, today we are covering two chapters, but Bill Olin pointed out that you don't have to go home for lunch, so we'll just move over here when I'm done going over two chapters. <laughs> but because of the two chapters, we will necessarily be doing overview. But one of the nice things, when we have reached these chapters, if you have been with us through the book, we have seen a lot of these major themes before. 
And that, in fact, are your themes that come up again and again. The sword of God's judgment, the fire of God's judgment, that, is, that Jerusalem is a wicked and a depraved city, that God's coming in wrath is completely justified. These are just some of the things that we have seen already in the first 20 chapters. And so we're going to be moving pretty quickly through this section. And what I will try to do is highlight anything that is particularly new or different that comes up. And our chapter, our passage, actually begins back in chapter 20. It actually begins all the way back up in verse uh, 45. And, and this is where the chapter break is in the Hebrew. Our English chapters don't break in the same place for some reason. And why this is important is because what happened at the end of chapter 20 is actually picked up at the beginning of chapter 21. And so when we move back to chapter uh, 20, we see that, he, that God comes to him and he tells him to preach against the south, to prophesy against the forest land of the Negev. That is verse 46. Now this Negev is the name of a desert land that is to the south of Jerusalem. Underneath the city of Jerusalem is nothing but desert and wasteland, and this is called the Negev. And so Ezekiel is to preach and prophesy to this desert wasteland. And the word is this, that God is going to come, that God is going to kindle and start a fire. And this fire will burn with such ferocity and such uh, a heat that it will consume both the dead and dry trees and also the green and living trees alike. There will be no difference between whether the tree is standing dead, ready to burn, or whether it is still alive. All the trees will be wiped out. And what's interesting, after Ezekiel prophesies this, the last thing that we see in chapter 20, verse 49, is that Ezekiel turns to God and he complains. He says, the people are saying about me that I am just a maker of parables. The people that is around Ezekiel, after he's been spending a couple of years uh, prophesying and preaching judgment to Jerusalem and lying on his side, he's saying, hey God, now these people are telling me I'm just making stuff up at this point. And so when we turn to chapter 21, God answers Ezekiel's cry, he answers his plead, he answers his complaint, and he gives him the interpretation of this parable of the fire. And the meaning that God gives it is this, he says, I am against you, and he's talking to Jerusalem, I am against Jerusalem, I am against the people, not Ezekiel, and I will draw my sword from its sheath, and I will cut off from you both righteous and wicked. And so the fire that burned both the dry trees and the green trees is a parable. It is a symbol for the sword of God that is coming. And when the sword of God comes to Jerusalem, that sword will cut down the righteous and the wicked people in Jerusalem. And so already through the book, we have seen the judgment by sword and by fire many times. But what is new, what is different now, what is even seemingly contradictory uh, to what we have seen in Ezekiel is the idea that the righteous people are going to suffer alongside with the wicked. Perhaps you're thinking, well, what about in chapter 18? In chapter 18, the people are saying, we're suffering because of our father's sins, that we didn't do anything wrong. And God comes and says, it is the soul of him who sinned that shall die. Perhaps you're thinking of chapter 9 where before the, the killer angels go out and wipe out the people of Jerusalem, first a man goes out and puts a cross on the forehead of all the people who have not given themselves to idols. And that cross is the symbol, it is the sign that protects the people. And so those killer angels go over and leave those people alone. And so it seems like, until this point of Ezekiel, that God distinguishes between the righteous and the wicked when it comes to judgment. But now he's telling us that the righteous are going to fall with the wicked. And so how do we put these truths together? Well, I think in some way we're actually supposed to feel the tension. But ultimately, I think the point is that God will not let his people suffer ultimate death that is eternal separation from him. Yet at the same time, when God's judgment comes in history, the righteous will suffer as well. 
We have seen in Ezekiel before that uh, even before the final destruction, when the enemy break down the gates and bring the sword upon the people, there is going to be total economic collapse, total societal collapse. And so if you're inside the city and there is mass starvation, there's no food, there's no water, there will be no distinguishing whether the righteous or the unrighteous when it comes to suffering. In order to, to get this idea in our head, we might think of another passage of Scripture, and that is our New Testament passage that was written, that, that was read this morning, sorry. And what we see is that there are two builders. The first builder builds his house upon the rock, and when the wind and the storms and the flood comes upon him, that house is able to stand. But there's another builder who built his house upon the stand, sand, and when the wind and the floods and the, and the waters came, that house fell. But what we should see is that the wind and the water, the rain, the hardship, the suffering came to each, regardless of what he had built his life on. The wind and the flood and the rain came just as surely for the righteous man. The difference is that the wind and the hardships and the rain did not ultimately wipe him out. But rather, when the judgment came, when the hardship came, when the struggles came, the righteous man, was his house, was able to stand in that day because it was built upon Jesus. And so being faithful to God is not a guarantee that you will not undergo suffering, that you will not undergo temporal judgment. If God is allowing our nation to feel consequences of our wickedness, our foolish and wicked leaders, our embrace of a culture of death and pleasure, then we cannot think that the church will not suffer alongside the nation as a whole. But we do know that God is faithful to his people in and through hardships. God's word never promises to protect us from harm, hardship, but rather that God will protect us in and through and during hardships. We have seen in verses, uh, in verses 1 through 8, the fire and the sword. In verses 8 through 17, we have a poem for the sword. In my English Bible, there are four lines set, at poet, set to poetry, but probably all the way through verse 11 is poetry. It is poem about a sword, a sword that is polished, a sword that is flashing like lightning, a sword that is sharpened and ready for slaughter, a sword that will be handed over to the slayer, a sword that will come against the people, a sword that will come against the princes of the people in particular. And what Ezekiel is to do is to take a sword that he has and he is to slap his side and he is to strike down the sword, seemingly a celebration of what God is about to do, a poetic gesture of celebration that God is coming in judgment. In verses 18 through 27, we see the agent of the sword. And this agent, this one that will come bearing the sword that, that Ezekiel had just spoken a poetry about, the one who comes bearing the sword in history is King Nebuchadnezzar. And what Ezekiel is told to do is to mark out a fork in the road. He's to, to come to a place where the road splits into two. He's to put up a road sign at that point. Now, we're not told exactly how Ezekiel is to do this. Perhaps he's to make a model once again, right? We've seen Ezekiel make a model of Jerusalem and sit there and play toy soldiers with it. Perhaps now he makes another model of a famous break in the road. And what he does, he puts a sign there of two roads, one pointing to the city of Rabbah and one pointing to the city of Jerusalem. And what this road represents is two ways that the sword that the king of Babylon is carrying can come. Now both these cities, Rabbah of the Ammonites and Jerusalem, were actually in allegiance with each other against King Nebuchadnezzar. So we know from history that both of these cities said, hey, we don't like this Nebuchadnezzar guy, let's work together and throw him off, throw his yoke off our back. And so Ezekiel is showing that Nebuchadnezzar comes here, he finds his fork in the road, and he's asking himself, who do I need to deal with first? Am I first going to go to Rabbah and deal with them, or am I first going to go to Jerusalem and deal with them? And so he stands at that fork in the road, and he begins to practice pagan magic. 
It says he shakes the arrows, which probably refers to throwing them and seeing which way they point to. He reads the teraphim, probably a kind of dice, which you would throw and see where it lands. He looks at the liver of a sacrificed animal, a popular method of telling fortune at the time. And all of these signs agree that it is to Jerusalem that he must go to. And so in, in verse 22, it is Jerusalem that he comes to and he begins the siege. And when we get to verse 23, the people say, oh, that's just false divination. That's false. That's black magic. We shouldn't listen to that. God is not going to matter to us whatsoever. In fact, they said, God has used that black magic to betray Nebuchadnezzar. God has fooled Nebuchadnezzar. But what is interesting is that the people do not believe that idols and pagan religion and magic is false when they use it. Right? They only believe that these things are bad, that these things are false, that they are foolish when it is, comes against them. Rather, So they, they thought that it was false in the fullest only because it harmed them if they had come in their favor. If, if uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had seen signs to go to Rabbah, they would say, Ah, our gods have saved us. Baal has sent him away from us. And so the people of moral compass would not turn to God, but rather it was turned toward their own desired outcome. If something promised them a good outcome, then it was morally good. And so when Baal promised a good harvest, personal fulfillment, or just a plain fun time, then it must be good. When Nebuchadnezzar's magical practices went against them, it must be bad. Ezekiel then goes and prophesies against the prince of Israel, that rebellious puppet king, Zedekiah. He calls him a profaned, wicked one whose day has come. He said that he, Nebuchadnezzar, will remove his crown, Zedekiah's crown, off of his head. And that will be the end of Israel's kingship. But then we get a very interesting few verses. He says that things shall not remain as they are. I will exalt that which is low, bring low that which, which is exalted. And then I think the NIV gives the, uh, actually the best reading of verse 27, which is this. A ruin, a ruin. I will make a ruin. The crown will not be restored until he whom it rightfully belongs shall come. To him I will give it. What I think Ezekiel is doing in this verse is looking forward to the Christ and to the kingdom that Christ brings. That God is now casting down the prideful, rebellious king, and out of that ruined kingship, another king will come, a king to whom the crown belonged to. And at that point in history, where God is look, that Ezekiel is looking forward to, God will restore his crown once again. And when he comes, his kingdom will be a kingdom that displays the truth of this passage. That his kingdom is a kingdom by which God throws down the exalted and the proud and the mighty in this world and he lifts up the humble. It is a kingdom which we find that the first are last and the last are first. It is a kingdom that teaches us that the meek are the ones who shall inherit the earth. It is a kingdom that the crown that is first restored to this one is first a crown of thorns. That the king's initial enthronement is to be lifted up on the cross. And so this is a great few verses of Ezekiel looking forward to Christ and his kingdom. In verses 28 through 32, what we see is a new thing in these chapters. And what we see in, in for the first time in the whole book of Ezekiel is that, yes, we have seen that God's judgment begins with his people, that God's judgment comes upon uh, Israel, comes upon Judah, comes upon Jerusalem in particular. But now we begin to see that after God deals with his people, his judgment then moves out into all the nations. After God deals with his people, he turns and judges all the nations. So the Ammonites that were spared when uh, Nebuchadnezzar turned and went to Jerusalem are not off the hook, but God says the sword is now drawn for them. When we get to verse 30, 
the sword is told to return to its sheath. Go to the place where you were created and the land of your origin, I will judge you. And so the idea here is that after the sword strikes down the Ammonites, it is to return back to Babylon, back to where it has uh, began, and there God will judge you. And so not only has judgment come upon Jerusalem, not only has it will also go to the rebellious Ammonite, but God is here telling Babylon that when I am done using you in history, when I have accomplished my purpose for you, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, then I will also judge you for your sins. And this is a major theme in a few chapters from now, and so we'll come back to it and visit it in detail. And so chapter 21 is all about the sword. Chapter 22 is all about the city. In chapter, in verses 1 through 16, we see the city of blood. And we are told right off the bat in verse 2, he tells Ezekiel, you will judge, will you judge the bloody city? Ezekiel wasn't called just to sit here at the judge, but as we saw last week, he is actually acting as the prosecuting attorney. He is the one bringing the charges, bringing the claim, presenting the case against Jerusalem. And in verse 3, there are two major charges brought. And it is these, you are a city that sheds blood, and you are a city that makes idols. Those are the two big things that Jerusalem has done. If you boil everything that they have done, they have shed blood, and they have made idols. And one thing that we should see is that these two things always go together. Our society likes to pretend that if they get rid of Christianity once and for all, if they can get rid of the biblical religion, then what will come in its place is a peaceful and loving utopia. But in reality, a society that rejects Christ looks more like Stalin starving 7 million Ukrainians or 60 million innocent dead in our country on the altar of sexual license. Idolatry and bloodshed go together. And we should see that he began to lift the particular uh, sin, sorry, in verse 6, and all these sins have a background in the Ten Commandments. So look at verse 7. Father and mother are treated with contempt. There goes the fifth commandment. They have profaned the Sabbath, fourth commandment. They slander one another, ninth commandment. They commit abomination with their neighbor's wife, seventh commandment. They take bribe to shed blood, sixth commandment. They make gain of your neighbor by extortion, eighth and tenth commandment. And the very last line, verse 12, God says, But you have forgotten me, commandments one through three are broken. God had given uh, his people ten rules that would lead them to life, that are life-giving, that if they would follow, follow them, that they would be living in accordance with the nature, living in accordance with how God created man, they would be living in harmony and unity with God, and therefore living in harmony and unity with one another. They would be personally and corporately flourishing, but here we had seen that one through ten are staunchly rejected by his people. And God promises to strike his hand against them and scatter them among the nations. In verses 1 through 16, we see the city of blood. And in verses 17 through 22, we see the city of dross. Now, you might not know what dross is, but when you uh, begin to mine something like silver, what you need to do is heat it up because that silver is combined with a lot of unwanted metals. Silver would be combined with uh, uh, iron and with tin and uh, other things that are listed here. So what you do is you put that in a pot and you heat it up and the uh, metals melt at different temperatures. And so when these impure metals uh, melt off, that is called dross. So it is everything that is unwanted when you are purifying a metal like silver. But what God tells Ezekiel is that Israel, what Israel has become, is 100% dross. He says all of them are bronze and tin and lead and iron, the dross of silver. That Jerusalem has become pure dross, that there is no silver to be found. And so God says, I'm going to do with you 
what you are supposed to do with dross. I will gather you, and I will blow on you with my fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst of the city. And finally, in verses 23 through 31, we see a city of corruption. Ezekiel here lists the different classes of people, the categories of society, and the sins that each one of them commit. First, he takes aim at the prophets. Prophets were those to, who were to speak God's word, to speak the truth, even at great personal cost. But rather, the prophets were gathered together in a conspiracy against the people. I think what's going on here is that the prophets had gathered and they have taken treasure, they have taken riches, they have been paid in order to give false prophecies of peace and security. Later on in chapter uh, 28, we get that the prophets were speaking lies in service of the princes. And so the princes really don't want people to be afraid. They don't want people to think that judgment is coming. And so the princes are probably slipping the prophets some money in order to give them favorable word to the people. The priests have done violence to God's law and have profaned the holy thing. Priests were supposed to be guardians of God's holiness, of God's holy places, of God's holy thing, but instead of guarding it, they were desecrating it. The princes, who were supposed to be the shepherds of God's people, have become wolves, tearing their prey, that is, the common people of Jerusalem. The princes are bent on destroying lives for their own profit. The regular people of the land are extorting money from each other and robbing one another and oppressing the very poorest of them. And they are ignoring all what God said about how they are to treat the sojourner and the poor among them. In verse 30, God says that I am looking for a man of the people who would build up the wall that is broken down, who would stand in the gap before him, who should, and if he finds that man, he would cease destroying the land. But he does not find any such man. And so what we should note, if you're really paying attention to that verse, you should note what God is doing. God is the one who is bringing his wrath, bringing his judgment, bringing his anger upon the people of Jerusalem in a very justified way. Well, at the same time, as God is bringing his judgment, he is looking for a person who will stand in the gap and who will stop him from destroying the land. One commentator said what we should see here is that God is on both sides of the wall. God is coming at Jerusalem in judgment, in anger, in wrath. And God is also looking for someone who will fend off his attack, protect the people, and stop him from destroying the land. Ezekiel doesn't spell it out, but in context, because he had just talked about the king and the prophets and the priests, God is probably looking for one man, one prophet, one king, one priest, who would not participate in the evils that were just listed, but would instead be a true leader of the people, returning to the Lord in faith and in righteousness. And God is looking around for that leader. God is looking around for that one righteous man who rejects the sins of the people, who stands in the gap, who protects the people. And God says that I find no man, at least not yet. And so not only does God bring his wrath upon the sinful people while looking for someone to come and stand in the gap and defend his people, but even more shocking is that God himself will become that king, that priest, and that prophet. Not only does God bring wrath, not only does he look for a man to stand in the gap, but he himself will become that man that will stand in the gap. That God himself will become a man to stop his wrath against his people. The Son of God will become a Son of Man in order to stand in that gap. We have seen time and time again in Ezekiel the justice of God's wrath and anger against evildoers, that the sword and the fire come against Jerusalem because they deserve it. But what we should not miss as we read through that is that this is true of us, that we are Jerusalem. 
that we have turned aside from God's word that gives life, that we have broken his commandment, that we have given ourselves over to idols. But when God saw no man standing in the gap, no man turning back God's wrath, God became man to stand in the gap for us. That the God-man Jesus Christ took off the fire of God's wrath, that he underwent the sharp power sword so that his people could be saved from that fire and that sword. And Jesus, those people that he has saved from fire and sword, Jesus also calls to join him in standing in the gap. He calls his people to come out of the cities, come out of the place of evil and wickedness, and turn to righteousness and to ur urge others to do the same. We live in a time, we live in a place, we live in a society where people are giving themselves over to foolishness and evil. And so we have to ask ourselves, where will we be found? Will we be found living with ease and with pleasure within the walls of the evil city or on our knees in the gap, pleading that God would restore us by his grace, that his fire would be a restoring and a purifying fire and not an all-consuming fire. As those who belong to Christ, let us be found where he is, standing in the gap with repentant hearts, seeking that God would come and restore us to himself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we would ask, we thank you for Jesus Christ, that one who stands in the gap, that one who turns back your anger and your wrath away from your people. Father, help us never to take that lightly, to take that for granted. And Father, help us to be found with him in the gap. Help us to come out of our wicked culture, to live differently, to live righteously, and to be found in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.